Hey there, this is Dr. Pawan, your surgery educator on our Canby platform and today I'm here to talk to you about the weekly test in general surgery part 2. So let us begin and let us have a look at the first question. So the first question says that there is a 35 year old man, yes, okay, he has been hit by a car and has been brought to the emergency room with a hypotension with a systolic blood pressure of less than 80 mm of FG. So basically they are trying to tell you that the patient is hypotensive and the patient is hemodynamically unstable. Now on examination you find that there is a tenderness and there is a bruising on the left lateral chest wall below the nipples and the x-ray basically shows that there is a fracture of the 9th, 10th and the 11th rib. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis of this particular patient? So what do you think is the answer to this particular question? Is it a hemothorax, is it a pneumothorax, is it a pneumoperitoneum or none of the above? So what do you think is the answer to this particular question? Well, the correct answer to this particular question is in fact, so if you're thinking that it is a hemoperitoneum, you are right. And if at all you thought that okay, so there is a kind of a chest trauma, there's a fractured rib and maybe the answer is hemothorax, you are not, you are wrong. So let me just walk you through what exactly is this question about. So again, if we just revisit it, there is a kind of person who has been met with an accident brought to the emergency room with hemodynamic instability. Fair enough. So it means that there is a blood being accumulated at one or the other place. That is fine. Now when you examine that the patient is having a tenderness on the left uh, lower chest wall and there is a fracture of the 9th, 10th and 11th rib. What you need to understand is that 9th, 10th and 11th rib are in close approximation with the spleen on the left side and with the liver on the right side. So if at all there is a fracture of the 9th, 10th, 11th rib on the left side, it will injure the underlying spleen and on the right side, it will injure the underlying liver. And that is the reason why this particular patient is coming to you with a hemoperitoneum because what is this person suffering from? He is suffering from a kind of a uh, splenic injury. Are you understanding my point? That is the reason the answer to this particular question is hemoperitoneum. So all you need to understand is that if at all there is an injury or the fracture of the floating ribs, it is not the hemothorax which happens, the hemoperitoneum happens because of the injury to the underlying spleen or the liver. I hope you get this particular point guys, right? So this particular figure or diagram is basically trying to show you that the floating ribs are in close approximation to the spleen on the left side and the liver on the right side. So if at all there is a fracture of the floating ribs on the left side, uh, the patient comes to you with a splenic injury on the right side the patient comes to you with a liver injury i hope you get this now next question for the day is uh, there is a teenager boy who has fallen from the bicycle and has been run over by a truck on arrival to the emergency room the patient is more or less destabilized that is fine but if you look at the chest x-ray chest of this particular patient what you see is a air fluid level on the left lower lung field okay so you see a air fluid level on the left lower lung field okay fair enough now if you pass a nasogastric tube in this particular patient what happens this tube is coiling in the left chest okay so which of the following is the next best step in the management of this particular patient will you go and insert a ICD on uh, the chest uh, like chest tube on the left side will you go in for a thoracotomy will you go in for a laparotomy esophagoscopy or a diagnostic peritoneal lavage so can you please tell me what is the answer to this particular question now take a minute just have a look about it and just tell me so if you are saying that the next step in the management of this particular patient is a laparotomy you are absolutely correct but if you are saying that it is kind of a placement of a left chest tube you are actually not correct so please understand Again, the clinical scenario, there's a patient who has been suffering from accident and has been brought to the emergency room. The patient is stable, absolutely stable. If you did a chest x-ray, you saw air fluid level and you passed in a nasogastric tube and the nasogastric tube was coiling on the left chest. This should not happen. The nasogastric sh uh, tube should enter into the stomach and it should be below the diaphragm. But because this particular question is suggesting that the tube is basically coiling in the left chest, that is why the answer to this particular question is like the diagnosis of this particular patient is a uh, kind of a diaphragmatic rupture leading to the herniation of the visceral organs into the thoracic cavity and yeah that is why the next step in the management of this particular patient is a laparotomy now this particular air fluid level it is not it doesn't indicate that the patient is having a hemodumothorax because the stomach is herniating into the left chest wall that is the reason why there is an air fluid level in the left chest i hope you get this particular point okay so that is why the answer to this particular question is laparotomy now I just told you why it is not the placement of a left side chest tube because that is the treatment for a hemoneumothorax and that is not the scenario in this particular case. Thoracotomy. Well, you can perform a thoracotomy. By performing a thoracotomy, you can actually repair the diaphragm. But why do you prefer to go in for a laparotomy and not the thoracotomy? The reason being, in the laparotomy, you get a chance to evaluate the other intra-abdominal organs also. But with the thoracotomy, you will be only be able to kind of repair the diaphragm. But the, it has been seen that the diaphragmatic injury is many times associated with some or the other intra-abdominal injuries also. And that is why, given a choice between a thoracotomy and a laparotomy, what you will prefer, you will prefer 
prefer a laptotomy. I hope you get this particular point. Now, esophagoscopy, well, yeah, it's not needed in this particular patient. And diagnostic parental lavage, well, it can diagnose kind of a diaphragmatic rupture, but uh, the diagnosis is more or less the same and it is kind of a clear. You don't need to perform a diagnostic parental lavage and more and all the more, the sensitivity of a diagnostic parental lavage to diagnose the diaphragmatic injury it is not very high and in this particular scenario it is not a matter of diagnosis you have already reached a diagnosis that the patient is having a, a diaphragmatic injury and yeah if at all you have reached this particular diagnosis the next step in management of this particular patient is a laparotomy and the repair of the diaphragmatic hernia i hope you get this right now let's move on to the next question okay so what you're seeing over here is there are the two x-rays on your left hand side what you're able to see is a patient who is having a air fluid level why because again the her like the stomach has been herniated on the left side i hope you're able to appreciate it and what about um like just adjacent to it you have an x-ray in which you can see basically the uh, nasogastric tube which is coiling in the stomach i hope you get this okay so these two x-rays are the of a patient who has been suffered from a diaphragmatic injury with the herniation of the gastric content into the thoracic cavity okay right now let's move on to the next question a 33 33 year old diabetic man receives a renal allograft okay so if there is a 33 year old diabetic man who has been um, subjected to a renal transplantation that is fine the physician chose to start the patient on cyclosporin one of the immunosuppressant drugs which of the following is basically the mechanism of action of this uh yeah so can you please tell me how does the cyclosporin acts pretty simple question guys okay so the question is basically trying to ask you how does the cyclosporin act so cyclosporin and the tacrolimus these are basically the calcineurin inhibitors okay these are the calcineurin inhibitors but how do they act they basically act by inhibiting the interleukin 2 production please understand the production is important they do not interfere with the functionality of the interleukin 2 what they do is they inhibit the interleukin 2 production now how exactly do they do so please understand cyclosporin and the tacrolimus they basically go inside the cell and they bind to cyclo uh, like calcineurin now what exactly is this calcineurin calcineurin is basically a phosphate so it is having an enzymatic activity okay so what does this uh, what happens this cyclosporin and the tacrolimus they enter inside the cell they bind to this uh, calcineurin and this combination of this drug with the calcineurin because of this the transcription of the interleukin 2 is reduced are you understanding my point so this uh, cyclosporin this doesn't act directly they it goes inside it inhibits the calcineurin which is in fact a phosphatase which is in fact necessary for the transcription of the interleukin 2 but because the cyclosporin has already combined with the kind of a calcineurin that is why the transcription of interleukin 2 cannot take place and this is how they act now if you just pay a close attention in this particular question so yes the answer to this particular question is in fact d uh, interleukin 2 production and that is the answer but if you just go a bit deeper into this particular question you will appreciate that because the history of this particular patient was patient has been suffering from a diabetes and that is why the physician has started the patient on cyclosporin now why did not the um, he start the patient on a tacrolimus because please understand tacrolimus is the one which is associated with the diabetes as is one of the side effects of this particular drug and that is why if at all you are wanting to treat a patient who is uh, diabetic that is better to start the patient on cyclosporin i hope you get this now this is another mcq which i just um, thought that i should mention it out here so please understand cyclosporin and tacrolimus both are the calcium inhibitors but if at all you want to choose any of these particular drugs in a diabetic patient it is better that you use tacrolimus i mean you it's better that you use cyclosporin because tacrolimus is the one which has a diabetes as one of the side effects okay now the last question for the today is there's a 45 year old woman who is complaining that uh, to the primary care physician that is fine of the nervousness sweating uh, tremors and the weight loss and all those things the thyroid scan of this particular patient has been performed and it has been shown to you now what do you think is the diagnosis of this particular patient is it a hypersecreting adenoma is it a graves disease is it a lateral aberrant thyroid or is it a papillary calcium of thyroid so what do you think is the answer to this particular question so yeah if i just ask you what is the most common cause of a hyperthyroidism the answer is graves disease but here what is the answer to this particular question can you please tell me 
just have a look at the particular question well the answer is hyper secreting adenoma why because why is it why it is not a graves disease so it is pretty much uh, clear right so this is a patient who is suffering from a features of a hyperthyroidism so all those nervousness sweating tremors weight loss all these are the features of a hyperthyroidism and definitely on the kind of a renal scan what you are seeing over here what exactly are you seeing you are basically seeing a hot nodule now what is this hot nodule i'll talk to you about it but please understand this is a patient who is suffering from a hot nodule and the entire thyroid gland is not having an increased uptake there is only a nodule inside the thyroid gland which has an increased uptake and that is why the answer to this particular question is hyper secreting adenoma i hope you get this now just have a look about the hot nodule warm nodule and the cold nodule so what do you understand by a hot nodule hot nodule is like if at all you give the patient a radioactive iodine and there is a part of a thyroid gland which is having an increased uptake then you will refer it to be as a hot nodule if at all there is a nodule inside the thyroid which is having the uptake same as that of a rest of a thyroid gland which you are able to see in the middle figure though this is what is referred to as a warm nodule and if at all let's say there is a nodule or a yeah there is a lesion in a thyroid which is having an uptake which is less as compared to the rest of a thyroid gland you will refer it to as a cold nodule i hope you get this particular point okay so if at all there is an increased uptake in a part of a thyroid you will call it as a hot nodule if there is the same uptake as a, of a rest of a thyroid gland you will call it as a warm nodule and if at all there is a reduced uptake as compared to the rest of a thyroid gland you will call it as a cold nodule i hope you get this particular point okay so this is the basis of a renal like the thyroid scan if you have just have a look at this particular figure what exactly is having there is a nodule inside the thyroid which is having an increased uptake as compared to the rest of a thyroid gland and that is why this is a hot nodule okay and that is why the answer is a that is a hyper secreting adenoma now why the answer is not the graves disease because if at all it would have been a graves disease you would have seen a figure like this okay so i hope you're able to appreciate this there is a kind of a normal thyroid which has a normal uptake but if at all the entire thyroid gland has an increased uptake then it is called as a graves disease so what is a graves disease there is an autoimmune disease in which there is antibodies which are forming against the entire thyroid gland and that is why the entire thyroid gland has an increased uptake and this is a patient of a graves disease but as we just saw this is an image of a toxic nodule and in this particular scenario there was a hyper secreting adenoma i hope you get this particular point now this particular figure what you're seeing over here is it a hot nodule or a cold nodule can you please tell me well in this particular figure what you're able to appreciate is a cold nodule okay so what is this this is a cold nodule why because you're seeing that the most of a thyroid gland has taken up the radioactive iodine but there is a nodule or there's a lesion in thyroid which has a reduced uptake as compared to the rest of a thyroid gland and that is why this is a patient of a cold nodule i hope you get this particular point okay so this is a patient of a cold nodule this is a patient of a hot nodule do not mess between these these are important images and lastly this is how a patient of a graves disease will uh, present to you now there is a very very common misconception among the students that uh, does this uh, thyroid scan helps in diagnosing the malignancy well the answer is no you do not perform this thyroid scan to know whether the thyroid lesion is malignant or not malignant why do you perform this because you just want to know the functionality of this particular lesion whether this particular lesion is hyperactive or this particular lesion is hypoactive this is all what you need to know at the end of this particular thyroid scan and as you can see if at all you get the result as a hot nodule around three to five percent of all the lesions which are hot nodule will be malignant okay and if at all you get the result as a cold nodule uh, nearly 15 to 20 percent of all the lesions will be malignant i hope you get this particular point okay so if at all you get a patient of a hot nodule there is around three to five percent chance of a malignancy in that particular patient and if at all you get a patient of a cold nodule there is 15 to 20 percent chance of malignancy so please understand a cold nodule there is an increased risk of malignancy but a malignancy can also occur if at all you have a hot nodule i hope you understand this and all the patients who are coming to you with a cold nodule they are not malignant so these are the basic things about the thyroid scan which i wish to talk to you i hope uh, you enjoyed this particular session i hope it added a few of the points to your knowledge and i hope you liked it and thank you so much guys uh, if you just want to explore what are we doing and if at all you are anywhere related to the pg you will definitely like it just go on the link below and explore the unacademy platform there is a 
a lot of free stuff which is available which might be beneficial for you and at the same time if you want to join any of the subscriptions of the academy please consider using my promo code my promo code is dr.pavan or drpavan slash yt whatever you can use if you use this you will get around 10 percent discount on whatever the subscription you want to take thank you so much guys it was indeed a pleasure interacting with you i hope you like this particular video and if you like don't forget to give it a thumbs up and see you next saturday again so yeah the next quiz like this is basically a weekly quiz in general surgery which i have started this is a part two of it if you if you have not checked you can check the part one and this will be done every saturday okay so every saturday this particular video will be uh, uploaded on the an academy platform and i hope you like this thank you so much guys stay safe and happy studying see ya bye